G'day guys, welcome back to True Footy and the football come down for round 17. For those unaware, this is a show where we unpack the weekend's results thanks to comments and contributions from you. The first comment is from Fidget Freeman Man who says, Teams that start the season well and have a long mid-season slump will get going again near the season's end. Happened last year with Carlton and Sydney. Yes, I suppose that's true. It certainly happened with Carlton and then with Sydney, I think they did resurge a little bit late to eventually make finals. This is definitely true, at least when I think back to the Eagles grand final winning years. I do remember in both seasons, we had a good start to the season, mid-year slump, come back before finals. I think that is probably the ideal way to do it. Jaden9465 has a bunch of conclusions from this round. He says, the Pies season is over. The Orange Tsunami is back. Informed cats are flag contenders. Suns won't make finals if they can't win away. And the Hawks hit with reality check, but season isn't over for them yet. I don't think Collingwood's season is over. Orange Tsunami might be back. Maybe. Informed cats probably a flag threat maybe i don't know i'm not really sure if i'm there yet suns won't make finals if they can't win away absolutely agree with that and the hawks hit with a reality check but season isn't over is another thing i would agree with but let's get into it game by game so what started with collingwood versus essendon um and essendon getting the dub this is a really impressive performance for mine and uh, they'll be really pleased that in a big rivalry game and um, they've come away with one win and one draw from the two games this year which i don't think people would have predicted at the start of the year and I think this result as well further demonstrates Essendon's maturity as a football team when you consider they conceded five of the first six goals to then steady and be driven by their leaders and best players. Absolutely. I de- identified at the start of the season with Essendon, I felt like there was a lot of players could go either way, start of their prime, and uh, it will ultimately decide whether Essendon was going to be a serious team in the future. Jai Caldwell was probably one of those names, even someone like a Dersma, Nick Martin, a lot of those guys sort of at the start of their prime. Perkins, a little bit younger than that again. But Jai Caldwell's improvement has been really noticeable in the last few weeks as he's gotten more midfield time. And in this game, he had 30 disposals, 8 clearances, and 7 tackles. We saw Dylan Shield also have a really good impact. And Zach Merritt had 15 score revolvements from his 30 disposals. He was absolutely unreal. And this was a really, really good win for Essendon. I think as the ladder took shape going into this game, Essendon hadn't beaten a top 8 side, if I'm not mistaken. And it's a far cry from where they were 12 months ago, where they finished the season with a combined margin of 196 points over the last two weeks. They look like... They're here to stay, this version of Essendon, so I'm happy to see it. We've got a few comments. PMAFL says, don't underestimate Essendon. They're ready to roll. Wild Rexy says, flag Dons 2024. And HPR says, Dylan Shield is back. Yeah, Shield in particular had a really good impact. 26 disposals, 12 in the last quarter, 12 contested possessions, 8 tackles, 6 clearances, and 2 goal assists. Very well-rounded performance from a guy that many of us probably thought was more or less done, or at least close to done at AFL level. Got some comments on Collingwood now. Billy75Chook80 says Collingwood are finished, and Marcus Marcus agrees, says the pies are cooked. Um, I don't necessarily agree that they're cooked. Are they a flag contender? It's going to be increasingly difficult to come back from where they are right now. They actually sit outside the top eight. But I do think they could at least still make finals, and if they make finals, they could push deep. But I don't think they're, you know, a real serious flag contender at this current point in time. They've had a bit of adversity this year. Is their window closed? No, not necessarily. I think we'll reassess again next year. But with an aging list, you never know. You never know. But they still have a lot of good players in their prime. We'll move over to North Melbourne versus Gold Coast, where the North Melbourne Footy Club got their first win in Melbourne for like a year and a half or something like that. Got over the line by four points against the Gold Coast Suns. Uh, much has been said of Damien Hardwick's frustrated comments saying they need to grow up, um, which is probably true to some extent. There is an irony as well with the fact that, um, you know, 2021, Hardwick makes those comments about Marvel Stadium. He hasn't won at Marvel Stadium since. And uh, I remember him losing to the Gold Coast Suns with Richmond last year, if I'm not mistaken, at Marvel Stadium specifically. And now, you know, he can't win there with the Gold Coast Suns. It's kind of mildly funny. But yeah, this was an opportunity missed for the Suns. But I do think we need to give a little respect to how North Melbourne's playing. It's been, it's not just an isolated win. They've been really good. And I think their young midfield in particular torched a very good Gold Coast Suns midfield. I know Miller got early, uh, injured early in this game, but they won the clearance that's 45 to 29. How good is Colby McKercher? I've been saying it for a while. I've been saying it pre-draft. I really wanted him at West Coast. Um, 37 disposals in defense. I think his first game back from injury. And, uh, you know, Harry Sheasel was good as well. So we'll get straight to the comments. There's a heap of North Melbourne comments. Party Pasco says, Sheasel is just as talented as Dacos. North have unbelievable young talent. And that McKercher five bounce goal assists. Yeah, that was unreal. He was fantastic. And if I'm not mistaken, didn't he also take the kick out? And then he didn't even look puffed after it happened. He was un- unreal. He, he says, Sheasel deserves AA. 
Optic Beast says, Hewitt and Jim Bidio isn't looking so good with Sheasel doing what he's doing at the moment. What I would say to that, so Sheasel could easily be All-Australian. Um, yeah, he's an absolute star. There is a lot of competition for sort of medium-sized defenders, and he has moved around the ground. I don't know if that will work against him, but he's All-Australian quality, that's for sure. As for the Hewitt and Jinby deal, um, I think it's kind of one of those things where it was the worst kept secret that Sheasel didn't want to leave Victoria. So yeah, Harry Sheasel would be amazing at West Coast right now. But given that Sheasel probably didn't want to play for West Coast, uh, let alone stay there, they, they traded for two West Australian talents, and in particular Hewitt, I think, has a big future. Pixel Knight says Powell can kick. That's another good point. He had an amazing battle that led to a goal. We've got a few Gold Coast Suns ones as well. Death, taxes, and the Suns losing away from home. Samantha Jane says, how good were the Suns finally getting an away win? Uh, say this tongue-in-cheek as my Eagles haven't done so yet either, but here's hoping we buck the trend today. That was posted before the Melbourne game. That did not turn out well. LD Sports 933 says, even with the easiest fixture in the competition, massive financial handouts from the AFL and one of the most generous priority pick assistance packages I can remember, the Suns continue to fail. Don't worry about a 20th AFL team. An easy solution to avoid an uneven amount of teams is to get rid of Gold Coast. I think the criticism on the Gold Coast Suns has been a little bit strong, generally speaking, because they're still on track to have their best ever season at AFL level. I think Kane Corns was firing up about them, and he's saying Stewie Jew would be sitting back and laughing, and I'm not sure that's true. I feel like the Suns have definitely improved this year, and yeah, they haven't won away from home, but I feel like it's a very simple fix what's happening there. It's just the ability to play consistently away from home, and I think that's kind of to be expected as, you, as a team gets growing pains. I don't know. Maybe I'm being too lenient, but I mean, they're still going to be on track to finish higher than they've ever finished in their history. Callum Williams says, now that Dimmer has identified the main problem that the Suns have had for their entire existence, the losing record away from home will be a temporary problem. I'm not sure exactly what you're referring to. Is it a maturity thing? Um, either way, I do think it'll be temporary. I think this is kind of just normal linear improvement. It is quite extreme statistically to go eight wins at home, eight losses away. So that is a little bit quirky, but nonetheless, I think they'll be fine. Let's move to Port versus the Western Bulldogs. I got this tip wrong. I thought the Bulldogs would, would school them or at least play well and win. Um, and Port Adelaide snapped back into some good form after some poor form for an extended, well, a reasonable amount of time in the middle of the year. And I think the midfield is clearly the difference maker here. We've seen Port Adelaide's midfield get beaten a little bit lately. And I think Rosie and Butters combined for 32 disposals in the first quarter. I think Rosie had 18 touches and Butters had 14. That is absolutely absurd. Bit of a dirty day for the Bulldogs. They couldn't get their midfield game up and running and they are one of the best clearance differential sides in the competition. I think they're up there with Fremantle or they were recently. So this is a big scout for the Port Adelaide midfield who really did need to click back into form. We've got a few comments here. Port and the Dogs are the most inconsistent teams in the comp. There has been a year full of inconsistent teams but you might have that correct as the two most unpredictable. I feel like the Adelaide Trows are a little bit unpredictable as well. Fremantle also have been inconsistent, but they are starting to buck that trend a little bit and get more consistent. But yeah, this was a clash between two inconsistent sides, and I suppose I shouldn't be shocked that I got my tip wrong this week. Bunch of Stuff says, Dogs are a confidence-based team through and through. They struggle to wrestle momentum back if they start poorly, and they lose their signature midfield mongrel because of it. However, like we saw in their bigger top eight quality wins, if they get on the board early, they can be extremely hard to stop. Sounds like a coaching issue to me. I think you're right. They've played some really good footy against some good teams and the midfield has absolutely, you know, flexed their muscle. And like I said, they were one of the best midfields statistically this season and they got absolutely torched. Now, Port Adelaide do have a very good midfield and they are also needing a response themselves. But I think you're right. There's, there's a maturity issue there, I'd say. Geelong hosted Hawthorne at GMHBA Stadium. It was the first time there's been a crowd at a game between Geelong and Hawthorne in Geelong since 2006. That's crazy. I think there was one game there in 2020. I got my tip wrong here again as well. I went with the form. Uh, even though Geelong had a win last week, I thought that the Hawks would get them. And uh, I didn't have enough faith in Geelong. And it turns out, well, two weeks in a row, Geelong have played well. And it's no coincidence, in my opinion, that Dangerfield's return has helped. I mean, I think he played limited minutes in this game, but he still had a really big impact and still a massive barometer for that footy club. And they do look a little bit better over the last couple. There's no doubt about that after a pretty disappointing form slump. We'll get to the comments. Xavier says, Geelong at their best looks scary. Guava says Geelong will finish top four. They have an easy run home. Yeah, it's a hard one to predict. There was a massive dichotomy between their best form and their worst form this year. Like they went 7-0 and 
and then they were pretty horrific there for a little bit, the Cats. And now they've had a couple of good wins, and I also think their win over Essendon looks even better now that Essendon went and played against Collingwood and won, and also played really well. So maybe the Cats are back, and in a year where teams are dropping wins left, right, and centre, um, they are absolutely a chance for top four. Haven't really analysed their fixture yet, but they've still got to overcome Fremantle and Essendon. But maybe, maybe, that would be crazy. Jai's Amazing says Hawthorne needs Sicily, and Joshua James Taylor says my Hawks get a reality check. Absolutely no doubt they got a reality check, and I agree with the comment at the start of this video. It's definitely not season over for them. As for them needing Sicily, yeah, I had a look and he has played in all of their wins except for one against St Kilda. I think it's fair to suggest that a team with defensive issues, or at least on paper, like the structure of their back line is a little bit of a mess. When you lose your captain and you're one of your best players, he comes out of the side. I think it's natural to suggest that, uh, yeah, they're going to take a bit of a hit. But I think they would have lost this game either way. On Saturday night, GWS were too good for Carlton in a topsy-turvy game. The Giants got 39 points down and their season looked absolutely cooked. They kicked 14 of the next 16 goals to eventually win 18-8 to 16-8. Both teams very accurate as well. We saw a late charge from the Blues, like I said, topsy-turvy game. But ultimately, the Giants just built too much of a lead and they, they couldn't overcome that. Jesse Hogan was a big factor in the air in this game. Mackay kicked five goals. You know, I think even Zach Williams kicked three goals. He's playing as a bit of a pressure forward now. The Blues started the game dominating the midfield. Absolutely no doubt about that. But I think Kieran Briggs stepping up against Tom DeConing as well was a big factor in this game. He had 22 disposals, 10 clearances, and 40 hitouts. I don't think Briggs has had the same year as he did last year, but this is a massive performance and probably went a long way to winning the game because Cornelio got his hands on the footy more. Tom Green was also a big factor. Um, Callum Ward has also been winning the ball and hitting the scoreboard as well. And we saw Toby Bedford go to Sam Walsh and keep him to 22 disposals, which by Sam Walsh standards is relatively low. We'll go to the comments. Mega Princess Penguin says GWS are still a threat. Getting a win against the Blues is huge. Doing it without their best two players this year, Kelly and Taylor, is massive. That's a really good point, actually. Josh Kelly and Sam Taylor are really important players. Are they still a threat? I hope so, because I said in my mid-season ladder prediction that they're going to play in a grand final. So I hope so, but they've left their run a little bit later than I was hoping. AFL Snap says GWS going insane after quarter time. Yeah, like I said, 39 points down. And I think they got at least five goals in front at one point. Ground Up Footy says Giants are the danger. Would not want to play them in, in the last seven weeks. Yeah, GWS tend to play seasons out very well, regardless of ladder position. We, well, we saw it last year. And they also tend to win finals when they get there. I agree, this could be a bad time to play them. And I don't even think Carlton played badly. Daniel Singh says Carlton are shit. I don't agree with that. I think, uh, well, I presume that's a little bit tongue-in-cheek anyway. But I think, you know, they played a team that played well. And both teams scored over 100 points. I think it was a reasonably high-quality game. And Carlton have been in good form. So this is a big scout for GWS. And for Carlton, I think they can kind of shake it off. I don't think it's a big deal, to be honest. On the same evening, Fremantle were too good for Richmond by the tune of 51 points. Josh Tracy, probably the standout here, along with Andrew Brayshaw. He kicked five goals, Tracy, which takes him to 35 goals, which is... Uh, I think just behind the top five in the Coleman medal, which is, yeah, damn. That's, I didn't expect that from a guy who's probably, I don't think he's even 22 yet. Sarong has had a terrific year, but I think he kind of didn't have his usual impact. And that's where we saw Brayshaw have 35 disposals, six clearances and a goal. He's still a very good player. The result of this as well is that Richmond now moved to 18th with North Melbourne uh, obviously beating the Gold Coast Suns, which is um, good for their rebuild in a sense. I'm sure they don't want to be last, but I think uh, it's interesting for draft watchers that might change perceptions of, the, of how the draft may go. But anyway, we'll talk about that in a different video. Interestingly though, one thing I will say from Richmond from this game, the Dockers are number one in clearance differential by some distance. They actually lost in clearances to Richmond, which is a pretty good effort. Nankervis 11 clearances, Taranto had four, Hopper had six, and after quarter time, the clearances were 37 to 24. So if you're looking for silver linings, that's it for you, Richmond. That was a, that's a pretty good result against a very good clearance team. Jaden Loder says, take away from the Freo game, this year will be the first non-Victorian grand final since 2006. Fremantle will play Sydney in the grand final this year. Sydney and Dockers will finish in the top four, and I can sense Freo making a grand final berth. These two teams have played in multiple finals, and I can sense a grand final between them. I, um, I would hate that. <laughs> No, not really. I, I do think that Sydney will be there. And it, it's it's still a little bit unclear who the best challenger is. I think it's it's been Carlton up to this point. But the gap is even enough that a form slump at the wrong time could throw things out. And Fremantle are going to be close enough. They are third. As Mr. Quito says, Fremantle sitting third on the ladder. They're going way under the radar. Two points off second. I think Fremantle do deserve to be there. I think... 
the consistency issues have improved. Uh, there was a big loss to the dogs, but other than that, they've been pretty solid this year. Who knows? There's still so much footy to play out, and it is tight at the top, but you know, it's not like, the craziest suggestion. The Sunday game kicked off with Melbourne versus West Coast. A live stream this game got up at 3:30 for it here in the UK, and uh, boy, did the boys deliver! Now, Melbourne far too good from the outset. I think it was like. Seven goals to one at quarter time. Um, and, you know, I think the Eagles sort of hung in there in the second half. I think they lost it by about five points. But the damage was done early, and, and particularly on transition, Melbourne were very, very damaging. I think Van Royen had a big impact. Uh, keep four goals, four could have had more. Considering they're missing a few soldiers, not the same, you know, demon side we've been seeing dominate the competition or at least, you know, be a premiership contender for a number of years. Like I said, Van Royen kicked four goals. I think Trent Rivers again continued his. Midfield development, he was one of the best players on the field. We saw Windsor have 25. I think Windsor probably hasn't had 25 at any point this year. Lots of youth in this Melbourne side. Um, and I'm not sure how it compared against West Coast, who has a mature team now. But that is something to be taken from this game, which they were always, always expected to win. Uh, for the Eagles, I'd say probably the positive for it was Oscar Allen finding a bit of form. He was genuinely dangerous, and they leveled the inside 50s. But obviously, this game was pretty one-sided. St Kilda versus Sydney. This might have been game of the round, you'd think. In, def in fact, it definitely was. Again, topsy-turvy. We saw the Saints start well we saw Sydney get out to a five goal lead I think they kicked six in a row and then St Kilda showed a lot of maturity to come back and pip them now part of this is also accuracy consider this 13 goal six against 11 goal 16 and now St Kilda have beaten Sydney by double what Fremantle did by winning by two points this is a great win for the Saints and Definitely a morale booster and a win they probably needed, and they, it was well-deserved. We really saw Sydney's performance fluctuate with the pressure St Kilda was able to put on. When it was on, Sydney were a little bit fumbly and couldn't play the game on their terms by any stretch. When that pressure faded, we saw Sydney kick six goals in a row, and then ultimately St Kilda clawed back with a really, really good performance. In terms of individuals, I will highlight Mateus Filippou, who's dropped with the VFL recently, had 26 disposals, 10 score involvements, and a goal of his own. So that's a really good result for them. There was a few other good players as well. I thought Liam Henry also impacted quite a lot. I did laugh at this comment. Papley lives rent free in your head says Logan McDonald is the biggest football terrorist ever. <laughs> What's a football terrorist? He says in all seriousness one seemed to be in a form slump. Yeah I suppose that's definitely true. Not playing horrifically. Um, I, I'm going to say that it's probably not going to be a two week thing either. I think they're gettable. They do have North Melbourne at the SCG. We'll see. I reckon that game could be better, better than we expect. Still premiership favourites regardless of that though. The final game of the round was the Brisbane Lions versus the Adelaide Troys. We didn't get any comments so just some brief thoughts on the game. Uh, Adelaide challenged the Lions better than I was expecting. I expected the Lions to put them away a little bit better and Adelaide con continuing this inconsistent form this year and they've looked good in some of their losses, I will say, at least in recent times. But it was Lockie Neal show. He had 22 disposals in the first half and three goals. Josh Dunkley also put in a pretty massive performance, really a big feature with his two-way running. He had 35 disposals, seven clearances, and a goal. And the biggest takeaway from this is that I think the Lions move into seventh spot. They're in the top eight now for the first time all season, I reckon. They do have a massive test against West Coast next week at Optus Stadium. We all know they're probably going to lose that, but they could stay in touch with the eight. Just to comment on Adelaide, I think this was a fairly honorable loss. I don't know what the mood is around their fans and what they expect, but I think the Lions at the Gabba is a tough opponent at the moment. The season shot for Adelaide, absolutely no doubt. They can't make finals and probably been one of the more disappointing sides in terms of Preseason expectations to where they're actually at at the moment, but they will take something from this. I'd be very happy if my team only lost by 11 points to the Brisbane Lions of the Gabba. Apples and oranges, I know, but I still think pretty solid performance from a crow side against a quality opposition in good form. All right, there we have it, guys. That is my take on the round that was. Uh, make sure you keep an eye out for this in the community tab. There was a few games here we didn't have any comments, and it always seems to be the Sunday games that don't. So it can make for a lopsided video. But for now, I, I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know in the comments what your thoughts, what your takeaways were from this round. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers.